It's two in the morning, and at the University of Toronto, a postdoctoral researcher named Debelina Roy is still awake. Her job involves culturing rat neurons. It's demanding work. The cells can be finicky, and they need to be monitored closely. In fact, Debelina has to check in on them every six hours, which is why she's still here in the lab in the middle of the night. My own body was living to the rhythm of these neurons because I had to get up in the middle of the night, get down to the lab. See, rat cells multiply quickly. And so to keep the lab from swimming in them, Debelina has to regularly cull and dispose of extra cells. That is to say, she has to kill some. It's a routine process called subculturing. But tonight, something not so routine happens. It's like a 2 a.m. I'm like, what am I doing? A biologist is supposed to stand at some remove from her subjects in the lab. But Debelina, in that moment, realizes that her relationship with these cells is not one-sided. The cycles of their lives are regulating her own life, too. She's acting on the cells, yeah, but they're acting on her as well. And now she's just about to kill them, just like that. You know, like, it was a real moment, like, who is doing what to whom, and... She hesitated, holding the incubator door. It's just a pause, but a meaningful one. Because after it passes, Debelina realized that she will never look at cells the same way again. Debelina Roy is not the first scientist to feel so deeply connected to her lab subjects. In the 1920s, a young cytogeneticist named Barbara McClintock appeared on the scene. She spent 50 years studying corn and was known for observing her specimens very, very closely. McClintock could pick up on even the most minute changes in each of her plants. She chastised other scientists for attempting to impose an answer on their subjects. She preferred to let the answers come to her through careful, sustained observation. It was slow, but fruitful. Although marginalized for half a century, her landmark work ultimately proved the chromosomal basis of genetics, earning her a Nobel Prize in 1983. What McClintock understood about her role as a scientist was this. The closer and more willingly you look at the world, the more it allows you to see. McClintock called this approach developing a feeling for the organism. And for her, nurturing that feeling was an essential part of being a good scientist. McClintock's extraordinary sensitivity earned her a reputation as a mystic. She believed that all life is interdependent and interconnected. This understanding has long been part of indigenous views of the world, but it was and continues to be neglected in many of the sciences. Debelina Roy wants to change that. That early morning experience in the lab with those rat cells, it led her to propose an entirely different scientific philosophy, one that builds on McClintock's feeling for the organism. It's one that opens up new avenues for research and could, in the process, make us more humane. In the lab, scientists form reciprocal arrangements with cells. They provide or withhold those conditions that allow life to thrive. In turn, the cells reveal their behavior under novel circumstances. This is a relationship, but is it a healthy one? Some feminist scholars, like Debelina Roy, have argued that the Western scientific worldview is rooted in the idea that we can control and subjugate an unfeeling world. And indeed, foundational thinkers in the history of science, like Francis Bacon, who wrote about enslaving nature to the service of man, and Rene Descartes, who once compared the cries of a wounded dog to the sound of an improperly functioning machine, they've cast a long shadow. But could we step away from this shadow and shine a light on a new, more equitable path? Debelina Roy thinks so, but only if we can move away from that impulse to dominate. I guess my goal is to just take us down a couple of notches, kind of 
uh, moving that human from that space of authority hierarchy or just this is the viewpoint that we need to think from only ever, right? She believes that this worldview creates hierarchies where they don't exist in nature. Instead, Debelina proposes that we place ourselves along a continuous plane, human and non-human alike. After all, we're different from cells, but we're also made of cells. We are life acting on itself. And shifting our perspective in this way, it seems like a small act, but it could have an outsized effect on the advancements that happen in science labs. I think that if we reorient ourselves, that might change how we ask scientific questions, which questions we ask, what we think we can use as raw material and extract labor from, or who, you know? Those encounters can sometimes kill. I think we need to reorient ourselves to like who gets to live and who doesn't. Who's to say that the humans are the only ones that need to thrive? Making an effort to feel for organisms in their fullness isn't only a philosophical position, Cozying up to the small things has its practical advantages, too. Yep, bacteria run this planet. They run this planet. Yeah, we, we just need to get on board, that's all. Sarah Richardson is a molecular biologist. Her hope is that humankind and bacteria can work together to produce useful materials, break down waste, and ultimately save the world. For example, she hopes to someday, someday train wild bacteria to convert unused biomass into petrochemicals. And to achieve these goals, Sarah and her team approach the bacteria that they work with not as subjects, but as collaborators. And that takes humility. No, I wouldn't say I'm smarter than a bacteria. I say I specialize in something different. In my lab, bacteria get anthropomorphized pretty quickly. They look picky. They look fastidious, or they look robust. They look un unfussy. They have personality. In my lab, they all get nicknames. Scientists like Sarah Richardson are showing us that there are ways of encountering the non-human world, even putting it to work for us, that emerge from a fundamental respect for life. Instead of dominance, Sarah opts for a different kind of power negotiation. It's domestication. Domestication is the secret. Like Barbara McClintock, Sarah lets the organisms speak for themselves. She studies where bacteria come from, what motivates their behaviors, and what they need in order to thrive. Only then does she offer them a deal. Help us, and we'll help you. If you want to succeed in bioengineering, it's easier to work with life than against it. We need their help to change the direction we're moving science in. We need their help to get us off a of petroleum standard. We need their help to remediate some of the damage we've already done to the environment. We need their help. So approaching them with a sense of arrogance no longer seems warranted. When we put our egos aside, it becomes easier to have a particular kind of empathy with the organisms that we study. Not empathy that would render us unable to experiment with them at all, but one that helps us to broker more sustainable arrangements with the non-human world. And that empathy, Sarah says, is what drives her curiosity about the organisms she studies. Domestication is not take some organism and make it do the thing you want it to do. That has never been the case. There's been no success in, say, turning a rose into a violet. Domestication is not, I have control over you. It's you and I are gonna make a pact for you to specialize more in something you already specialize in, and for me to make the deal that I'm going to protect you while you do that. It's a process we've used for centuries, from taming wild dogs to transforming maize into corn. And it's still at work. You see it in McClintock's discovery of the transposon, a DNA sequence that can change its position within a genome long before the invention of genetic sequencing. Or in Roy's cell culturing method, which helped her discover new forms of communication between estrogen receptors and brain molecules. This approach is mutually beneficial, most of the time. That's why pigeons are tragic, because we, we, we made a deal with pigeons, and then we invented phones. 
Synthetic biologists have built their disciplines around the premise that life is a text that can be edited, rewritten, and translated by organisms. Once bacteria have performed the task we want of them, though, they're promptly discarded. But what if there was more to explore there? What about the other parts of the life of these organisms that we're not paying attention to? Debelina says it's a missed opportunity to deem our counterparts in the lab worthy of our care and attention only when they're productive. Because how we treat the microcosm is a reflection of our attitudes in the macrocosm. We've deemed some humans better than others because we've been able to appreciate what they are or what we've deemed as being important. When we question hierarchies, even at the molecular level, we're engaging in a radical act of humility. And it's one that manifests in our human relationships too. It's the project of a lifetime for us to see ourselves as one of many. We are all carriers in our own way of the patterns of life. And by deliberately decentering the human perspective, we only become more humane. Thank you.